The Reconstructionist Radio Podcast Network brings to you The Meat of the Word Q&A with Martin Salbretti, Vice President of the Chalcedon Foundation. Join Martin as he conducts regular Q&A sessions on topics of interest to Christians serious about their faith. These Q&A sessions will continue to cover an ever-widening range of topics, all with an eye to honoring the command to let all things be done unto edification. Good afternoon and welcome to Chalcedon's Q&A session for Sunday, July 2nd, 2017. This is Martin Salbretti, the Vice President of the Chalcedon Foundation. And uh, these are the times that we've set aside for taking questions from folks who are curious about various aspects about the application of the faith for all of life. Uh, I'm still in a horizontal format this time, but we will try and uh, move toward a vertical format because I'm told that might help me see the entire question that's being asked. Uh, it compresses it down to four lines, and uh, that little more button doesn't actually work for me in a horizontal mode. Which brings us to a little housekeeping. Sunday, from one Sunday from today, I will be in Reading, Pennsylvania for the uh, Future of Christendom conference, and I will still be there at the time the next Q&A should occur. So if we find we have the technical capabilities to move forward with a Q&A session, we will proceed from the midst of Pennsylvania rather than uh, central Texas for next week's Q&A. Uh, but we'll let you know. We'll, uh, we'll post that it's either canceled because of we can't go forward or we'll proceed from Pennsylvania. Uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, we will actually be doing the rough cut of the uh, Dr. Kishore movie, Hero in America, will be uh, premiered, at least the rough cut screening, uh, this Friday, February 7th, I mean, July 7th. Pretty exciting uh, situation. Of course, it's not finished with post-production. There'll be some more footage to be shot and incorporated, but it'll give the uh, attendees at that conference a chance to see uh, what Joaquin uh, Fernandez at Great Commission Films has been putting together uh, with all this stupendous material. We've received at least one question in advance of this session, and uh, we certainly do invite folks to forward them. Uh, if you look down at the bottom of these lists, there's a post by one of the uh, coordinators that suggests that you can uh, ask Calcedon the question, and then they'll get to me beforehand. And this question came from Kevin Amundsen. He asked, on page 846 of Rashtuni Systematic Theology, there's a reference to the heretical doctrine of soul sleep. Could I comment on it? What is that all about? This is in connection where Rashtuni is talking about uh, the eschatology of the individual, the individual person, and what happens at their death. Personal eschatology, we call it, the end point for an individual man, woman, child, as the case may be. I first heard the term soul sleep uh, in correspondence with Dr. Lorraine Bettner when we were discussing aspects of the Book of Revelation. And in that connection, uh, again, he had a, a very dim view of the idea. The basic premise of soul sleep is that when you die, uh, not only does your body go to sleep in the grave, so to speak, uh, you're also completely unconscious until Judgment Day. You're just held over. It's like you blink and then you're there at the White Throne. And you, it's like anesthesia in an operation. You, you don't know what's going on. So literally your soul is asleep. It's an unconscious time, the intermediate state, that state between your death and the final judgment, the resurrection, uh, is considered um, black space, nothing there, uh, empty set, as the mathematicians would call it, and no awareness. And that's what the soul sleep doctrine is. Uh, it is almost certainly an error, and there are plenty of biblical reasons to think so. One aspect of it is that there's a, the, Jesus tells the story of the rich man and Lazarus, which obviously implies there's no such thing as soul sleep because the entire conversation and the experiences of the rich man and Lazarus and Abraham all occurs in the intermediate state. Uh, and the only way to evade that is to say this is just a massive metaphorical story with not a scrap of truth to it. It's a, merely a teaching uh, mechanism and, and nothing more. And that's saying quite a lot because the parable tends to gain some of its uh, truth from the point that the point of comparison has some legitimacy, not that it's a complete fraud. And uh, so that's problematic. To, to build an entire doctrinal issue from a lie would not make a lot of sense. It's a relatively casual uh, approach to the scriptures uh, and saying, well, God speaks like men do. 
and uh, can't trust what God says there. We can easily, with a snap of the fingers, dispense with it and saying, I just spiritualize that. But there's certainly plenty, plenty of places, places other than Scripture, other scriptures, where this doctrine is taught and therefore uh, ought to be taken seriously. If only for the case of the elect, we have this passage in Revelation 6, 9 to 11. John looks under the altar and he sees the souls of them you know, who have been beheaded for the testimony of Christ. And they cry out, how long, O Lord, before uh, you uh, render justice to us, avenge us of our enemies, so to speak. And it was given them a white linen robe to wear, and they were told to wait a little season until uh, the rest of the brethren had also run their race, until they complete their race. So there's interactions and transactions and emotion and appeal to God, uh, supplication to God, for wrapping, wrapping things up on the part of the souls under the altar. Another point, of course, is that uh, when passage in Revelation 3.21, correct? Those who overcome, will, Jesus says, I will give with you to sit with me in my throne. Uh, and so overcome is to be faithful unto death. So the sitting on the throne and probably the ruling uh, of the nations, the judging of the nations, is something that occurs in the intermediate state. We rule with Christ from his throne. What is a single throne in Revelation 3.21 is expanded to multiple thrones thrown on in Revelation 20. I saw, saw the souls of them again. Not them, but the souls of them. And uh, so these are uh, disembodied souls. Now, Rush also makes a very important point that the disembodied soul is not complete. It awaits the resurrection of the body. He points out that Neoplatonism has had a disastrous effect on the church. And under Neoplatonism, your deliverance is from this body. The body of physical reality is the problem. We just need to dispense with that and move into a purely spiritual realm because that's where all good things happen. Uh, the spiritual is the good and the physical is the bad. And this is not true, as uh, Rashtuni points out in Genesis 131, when God created everything, including man as a physical being, living soul, it was all very good. There was nothing wrong with it. And as Rashtuni would say, Satan is a completely 100% spiritual creature, and it does not make him good. There's no guarantee of it. So it's the whole man, body and soul, that passes through the uh, final judgment uh, and is reunited. The general resurrection is a big deal. It's the conquest of death. That's predicted in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 24 to 28. And at that point, Jesus completes all his conquests by destroying death itself. And at that point, there's a reuniting of the soul with the body. The body is brought back uh, incorruptible. The soul is brought back in, with, together and is reunited. See, death is not a natural thing. Uh, death is actually one of the most unnatural things that could happen because it's tearing apart things that should never have been torn apart. The only, uh, which is the body and the soul, they were intended to be a unity from the get-go. So the sundering of the body from the soul is a major catastrophe and completely unnatural. It entered into the world through the sin of Adam. So we have this passage in Ecclesiastes uh, 3.21, I believe it is, where he asked the question, who knows of the spirit of man that it goes up when he dies and the spirit of an animal or a beast that it goes down back to the earth? And this kind of comports with later in the same book where the writer in chapter 12, verse 7 says, uh, you know, when the man dies, the uh, body goes back to the earth, the dust, if you will, and the spirit returns to God who gave it. So there is a destiny, if you will, at that point at death. But there's also something bigger than death, because Christ conquered death, openly uh, conquered it, and he's the first fruits of a great harvest of the uh, conquest of death. And I think there's great passages that can be read in Warfield and other scholars about this. Uh, Prophecies of St. Paul, written by Warfield, is one of the best little discussions on this point. So all this to say, uh, the soul sleep basically tries to buy some time uh, and, and make death more palatable, particularly for the unregenerate, as opposed to what we see clearly in that uh, picture that's presented in the Gospels about the rich man uh, being in a pretty bad place and quite conscious of it. These are all fall into the category of what's called mortalism, ways to make the soul, annihilate the soul and things in this order. And that's where the problem arises, is that we uh, want a palatable to us uh, end life. And uh, it's, not, it's not our choice. God governs everything. 
and God, God is in control of this, and He regulates all of this too. So that'd be the first question that we've uh, we've posed, and that was again asked by Kevin Amundsen. Soul sleep, the doctrine that Rosh Hashanah held as heretical. I'm not sure he means damnable heresy, but certainly heretical, uh, erroneous, aberrational, uh, and in conflict with Scripture that holds that you're unconscious after you die. Well, that's an interesting point. How do we then define spiritual and spiritual living, as in walk in the Spirit, in Galatians 5, other passages? Uh, again, we come to passages similar like this in uh, the opening verses of Romans 8. And I think, clearly, if we don't tie walking in the Spirit with the, uh, the righteousness of God and the justice of God, which is defined in the law of God, then we have a lawless walk, and we have basically uh, a contradiction in terms. You know, and there's... A, and the question is, how does God then rule the Christian? Truly, what happens is the Spirit to us. So instead of being a sentence of death, which it should by rights be because of our uh, original um, naturally born an antagonism to it, hostility to the law of God, uh, we now establish the law of God. So to walk in the Spirit is also to walk in terms of the law of God. And uh, that's kind of what the New Covenant's all about in the first place. You know, I will t uh, write my... Uh, laws in their hearts and their minds will I inscribe them. And who does this writing? Well, it's the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit is actually there in us, quickening it, making it alive to us. And one of the big disasters, the big divides in modern Christendom is to try to split the Word of God into pieces and uh, relegate it from here to here to here. And in the big shuffle, the law of God is left. And all we have are the negative passages about no more condemnation applied to the entirety of the law, saying, you know, the Ten Commandments is a dead letter to us. Well, actually, it's you that are dead to it. It's not dead. It's quite alive, and uh, it'll last till the end of time. Here we have those folks that uh, have a problem with what Jesus is saying in Matthew five seventeen and 18. And there's a, uh, maybe uh, my technical director can throw up the article that we wrote. Uh, Does theonomy have a fatal error? And it was... Um, cover article in a Faith for All Life magazine where we go into some extent on the interpretation of Matthew 5, 17, 18, and how it ties in with number 19. There's one verse in Scripture that's very hard to explain from the notion that the law of God has got nothing to do with the Christian anymore, and that's Matthew 5, 19. You know, whosoever shall loosen even the least of these commandments and teach men so shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoso shall do and uh, teach and do shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. So your status in the kingdom of heaven is determined by your attitude toward even the least of God's commandments, that they're important to you. As we're, I usually say when I lecture on this topic around the country, what is the least commandment? That's a good question. The uh, rabbis hold that it's Deuteronomy 22, verses 6 and 7, given instructions what to do when you encounter a bird's nest full of eggs on the ground. Can't get any more mundane and trivial than that. And yet, it says, if you follow God's law with respect to this, which preserves the species, uh, there's a promise attached to that. If you read the seventh verse, it says, and so that your days may be long in the land that the Lord thy God giveth thee. And that's kind of astonishing, because the first time we read that promise, it's in the, the commandment, right, to honor your father and mother, the fifth commandment, that your days may be long in the land. Well, here, all, all of a sudden, the most minor commandment of God is the exact same promise. And to me, and to most folks who look at it with a serious eye versus a skeptical eye, that means that all the love of God contains a blessing to it. That we, there are certainly weightier matters of the law. But even when we confront those, we only uh, dismiss the minor ones if they're in conflict. If you have to have a choice, you have to pick the weightier the matter of the law. But if there's no choice to be made, then we worry about the entire law because God gave it to the whole man, to the entirety of us. Uh, to walk in. And this is how dominion occurs. And this is how self-government, Christian self-government, that's the engine of it. That's the kind of the transcript that it says, how ought we then to walk? The famous question that Francis Schaeffer then, how then shall we live? Well, we will live according to the law of God, but not in a legalistic way because it, there's no flesh shall be justified by works of the law. But in terms of sanctification, it is, this is the way walk ye in it. And this is the path, this is the light unto our feet. And it gives us that highway of holiness that's spoken of in Isaiah 35, 8. So walking according to the Spirit, if it's walking against the law of God, we have a fundamental problem. 
uh, that would mean that the Spirit is contradicting itself. Which brings to mind other passages about uh, spirits and prophets. The spirits of the prophets is subject to the prophets, we are told in Scripture. So everything is subordinated to what's already been written. You know, that's the blessing, that we have a, uh, a, a delivered, closed set of legislation. God's not adding to it or switching it around or playing games so that what is okay now is going to be wrong tomorrow. Uh, Instead, we have something that's consistent because God is not the author of confusion. Most of our problems with the law of God stem from ignorance of its details. And there are certainly many people who are hostile to it, who are willing to sloganize a passage, take it out of context, uh, impose a straw man interpretation on it, and then to judge the law of God with their moral code. In other words, they stand as judge over God. They put God in the dock, to use the famous phrase of C.S. Lewis. And, and that's disastrous ethically because now man's in charge. Man is now the lawmaker. And you can forget, therefore, whatever Isaiah 33:22 says when Isaiah concludes that chapter with, you know, he's our king, he's our judge, he's our lawmaker, he will save us. So he's a, uh, salvation comes from him, law comes from him, uh, he rules as king and he judges us according to that same law. So he functions in all four capacities. So the Christian's obligation, therefore, is to uh, keep the law. And the way he walks is according to the light that God gives him in the law of God. So the Christian, should, if anything, should be the uh, beacon of God's law. Uh, and that's a high appreciation of God's law gives a high appreciation of the gospel and the love of God. Because when I promote the law of God, what's the biggest law that I'm promoting? Love the Lord your God with all your mind, heart, spirit, and strength. You see? And the second one is like unto it, to love your neighbor as yourself. Both passages are not in the Ten Commandments. They're in Deuteronomy and in Leviticus 19. And this is important to realize that um, these two hang all the other parts. So uh, the way that you love the Lord your God is one of the ways that the Scripture uh, defines it in the law of God. And the way you love your neighbor is also laid out. And there's also, if you will, a love for creation, a respect for creation. Not reverence for creation. Reverence is reserved to God Almighty. But respect for creation is biblical. And that's important because we have a stewardship relationship to the things that God made, the animals and even the uh, material world that was uh, given to us to take it care of. Question is posed. Is there a substantive difference between ethics and morality? Um... I think they have obviously a, a common core because both of them are going to tell you what you ought to do, what you should do. And the question is, how do you arrive at ought or should if your worldview is premised on a chaos, in other words, say an evolutionary worldview? Then man has to bootstrap himself up and uh, c create all sorts of mechanisms by which uh, we create a law code on our own steam. And every time we do that, we assert sovereignty for ourselves. Whoever makes a law in a situation system is the God of that system. So it's either going to be God's law, and He's the sovereign, and He's Lord, and He defines what's right and wrong, or we define what's right and wrong. So ethics and morality have uh, a common core in that they represent the, the volitional, the will, if you will, the aspect of the reality that doesn't science can't really address, because science can only describe and predict, can I tell you what you should do, and uh, what you ought to do, and what you uh, are commanded to do. Who's got the authority to command? Well, the reason that God has authority to command is several fold. One, He created everything, and therefore He can expect fruit from uh, everything that He created, and, that, and He made it to be fruitful, and He made it to glorify Him. Uh, all things are supposed to come together to glorify Him, including us. And the difference between me and a cow doing it is the cow is unconsciously glorifying God and eating the grass and producing milk and what have you. And I am to do it consciously. And what we do instead is rebel. And so what happens in a lot of ethics and morality discussion is that the um, foundation of the ethics is something other than a revelation from God. And if it's not from God, if it's from man, then it is founded on the sand again. And we have the whole notion of building something, a structure, a house, on the sand. And it's always shifting sand. Ethics today 
and an ethics book written today in a university will not have the same content as an ethics book written 50 years ago or 100 years ago. They'll always be different because mankind's always marching into a different worldview as he starts to become more uh, self-conscious of his rebellion against God and his insistence on being sovereign. And as Rushdie points out, there's uh, this lust for sovereignty occurs at the individual level and at the state level. When the state uh, becomes more and more intent on being sovereign, what does it do? It increases its power over the people and becomes more tyrannical. What does the individual do to assert his sovereignty against the state? He rebels against the state. He becomes um, more uh, committed to his uh, hostility toward the state and its apparent encroachment on his sovereignty. So you have two conflicting sovereignties at the same time, that of the individual tending toward anarchy and that of the state tending toward totalitarianism. And essentially what happens is that you always end up with the latter. It's a totalitarian result because the individuals um, generally can't create the revolution they seek. And we at Chalcedon always point out this answer is never revolution. It is always regeneration. It's bringing Christian self-government to play. And that's why walking in the Spirit is an important element when it's understood or right, not as I'm going to listen to what God's going to say to me because otherwise I'm frozen in position and I have nothing to do because I want to wait on God. And yet God has given us so many things, an entire charter, uh, an entire world really, to take captive to the obedience to Him. Every thought captive to the obedience to Christ. And that's the mission. And the second point there is you, when you're going to do that, even in the area of ethics and morality, you should not use worldly tools, right? The weapons of the flesh don't apply in ethics or morality either. Rather, we need uh, the godly weapons that are mighty to the tearing down of strongholds. And some of these strongholds are the ethical teachings uh, propagated at the university levels from all sorts of philosophers, of eth aestheticians, whatever you want to call these folks. Uh, it's all premised on something that is bootstrapped out of nothing. And, and that's why, as Rush points out, when the United States, you know, all these court cases try to support the sovereignty of the United States, they go back to uh, even Roman law and uh, medieval uh, laws and things in this order, they, they, they have to go farther and farther back to f try to justify a sovereignty on the part of the state, godlike powers on the part of the state, where it's the state or nothing, you know, their way or no way. Yeah, th uh, thank you, Brian Edwards. That point about regeneration and not revolution is very important because, again, revolution, what are we dealing with there? Those are the weapons of the flesh, uh, the ones that we're not supposed to use. Uh, it's tempting to use them because often we say, well, pragmatically they work. But that's not the message. That's not the re a re adequate reason to do something. The pragmatic reason is not. It has to be, is God, has God required it? And does God permit it? And if God neither requires nor permits it, then that's not an option. One of the biggest mistakes in ethics is the idea that the ends justifies the means. Scripture is almost alone the biblical ethical system and saying that is absolutely untrue. The means are critical and they cannot, you cannot set aside your uh, truth and justice in order to gain a certain goal. This is exactly what um, the Jews of Jesus' time attempted to do, right? It's expedient that one man died that the whole nation not perish. See, that's pragmatism. And that sends your Savior to the cross and it meant the death of Israel. There's a sense, yes, re revolution is more about bloodless than political change, uh, Brian Edwards uh, tells us. A and in essence, that is because the revolution is to reassert sovereignty and reposition it from one human basis to another human basis, fundamentally. Uh, and we don't want to do things God's way. Our mission, of course, is to uh, be in with God in raising foundations for, the, for many generations. And that's a task that most people don't want. They want the quick, dirty answers. And I think we've touched on this, almost every one of these uh, Q&As, that uh, too many Christians want the quick and dirty answer and don't want to do the uh, <clears throat> excavation with the spoon that's actually required. Uh, <clears throat> Charles Roberts asks, Martin, can you speak to the issue of how pietism impacts ethics? <coughs> Part of the problem with pietism is that um, it restricts the range of concern for the Christian to what's between his ears, his heart and his mind only. Uh, and it limits any societal impact beyond that scope. So your prophetic voice of the church is muzzled. You may not do like John the Baptist do and uh, confront uh, Herod Antipas. You know, it's not lawful that you should have uh, Philip's 
the wife is your wife now, etc., etc. Herodias. Uh, these kind of confrontations will not play in the pietist mind because to him the most important thing is your personal walk. There is no social component to the faith so far as the pietist is concerned. Uh, it is drowned in the importance of the individual. Your own personal walk comes first. Now there's a sense in which, of course, Christian Reconstruction always begins with yourself. You cannot um, reform others if you're not intent on reforming yourself first. That hypocrisy, like I said, people smell it a mile away. And nonetheless, the pietist has now uh, put us into a Christian ghetto. So when we speak about ethics, we talk about only personal ethics. We might be quite comfortable saying, well, we're not going to speak to uh, the state's taxation, the state's on abortion, all these other issues, because uh, my personal walk is the fundamental sum and total of my faith. So pietism, by having a very crabbed outlook of restricting the faith to yourself uh, and salvation only. In other words, get other people saved, put them in the same navel-gazing mode as you're in, and that's all that we need to do. And then we hunker down and wait for Jesus. And that's that's the sum total of the faith. It's a slightly caricature I'm pointing out here. Uh, I'm painting it so that it's clear. There may be variations to this, but what we find everywhere that pietism has prevailed that the state grows huge and becomes totalitarian in its aspect and, and claims sovereignty because the church has withdrawn. And nature abhors a vacuum. When the church withdraws and, start, and stops claiming Christ as king, then human kings are more than happy to take up the slack. And they do. And they do an excellent job of it, of uh, pushing us back into the ghetto that we've carved out for ourselves. So it's a self-inflicted marginalizing that we face here. And that's the problem with ethics, because if ethics is not global and, and affects all of us, the common standard, then, of course, it's, uh, it's a crapshoot, and it's anyone goes. Anything goes, and anyone can do anything they want. And I see Charles has added to this, Calvinism reduced to dour men who constantly preach the five points to each other. Sounds like something Dr. Restroni could have easily quoted, and I wouldn't be surprised if that was a quote, in fact, uh, from one of his books, Charles. And that's the problem, is that the world-encompassing aspect of the faith now only encompasses yourself. And it has nothing to say to anybody else. And that's the problem. And I call it navel-gazing because fundamentally we're having arguments amongst ourselves. We're fighting inside the ghetto for who gets which little piddly hill in the ghetto to, to command. Okay, yeah, that, that's, that makes sense that it's from the Book of Sovereignty. Andre says, regarding the smallest aspect of the law, some people will say, and then it's the beginning of a quote, and I guess I will see it scroll up here momentarily, assuming our signals are working today. You have to love the, uh, the technology that we have. And I'm not seeing it yet. And it is a remarkable technology when you think about it that I can be seated here in my library and uh, throw an iPhone on a tripod and here we are talking to hundreds of folks over the course of the week. Uh, but we've had fewer questions this time around. Andrea, do we have the rest of that question yet, perhaps? I will not comment. Someone, uh, well, these are not a salvific issue. Is there such a thing? Of course, there's no, such a thing. Is a uh, uh, they're they're not salvific issues. We already said that in Matthew five nineteen, correct? <clears throat> Whosoever shall loosen the least of these commandments and teach men so, shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. In other words, what you offer up to your King who saved you on the on the cross is the bare minimum. That is, uh, that is you, and you'll have that for the rest of your life into eternity, the knowledge that that's exactly what you did. It doesn't change your salvation, but it does change your standing. Otherwise, that entire verse means nothing, because he contrasts the least to the greatest. Now, humanistically, who's great and who's least? Well, this is usually determined by other canons or standards, but Christ laid out only one that uh, is significant, and it relates to our relationship to the law of God. And therefore, he, that's why he calls us to follow him. He's the captain of salvation, right? We're uh, uh, an author and finisher, and we need to follow his example. His example was one of law-keeping. 
uh, and that would make him a suitable uh, blemish-free lamb for the sacrifice. If he was lawless and breaking the law left and right, he's not as fit to uh, die on for our sins. He'd have to be the just for the unjust. We stand there in that equation as the unjust. <laughs> Thank you, Leah. That's a good point. Yeah, we're trying to use this technology uh, for good. There's no reason not to. Christians should be the last people who should be afraid of technology. I've lectured on this in the topic of music way back in 1983 uh, and 89 too in Chicago at the World View Conference there, is that uh, we should embrace these things because they allow us extended dominion with improved tools. And that makes a lot of sense, particularly in music. I have an orchestra, full-size orchestra, sitting in my Mac computer at this point where I can compose uh, symphonies and soundtracks and things in this order. This was unthinkable 30 years ago. It couldn't be done. You had to hire out an orchestra at great expense. So the power of technology means that these tools start to expand the range of what Christians can do, particularly in the educational front, which is a big area, uh, an area where self-government uh, also has a part to play. So when they, uh, going back to the question that was asked, these little things about the law, uh, they show simply that, uh, one, we might be mistaken. We might have been convinced. Yeah, uh, East-West is exactly the library I have, Leah, and it's a pretty doggone good one. Um, the others, of course, the Vienna uh, Library is a big one. I know my uh, my uh, Benjamin Botkin uses that and others for his work. But I like the uh, East-West Orchestra primarily because it's all recorded in one hall, and, and when you mix it, it's got the right ambience. The orchestra sounds correct. And Brian Edwards points out, a certain president has utilized technology to powerful effect. And this is because... The, um, he's gone around, as we're talking about obviously President Trump and his predilection for tweeting and go, making in runs, good and bad, around the existing mainstream media. And the reason I think this is clever uh, on his part, uh, setting aside the content of what he says, is that he's no longer beholden to someone to filter out everything that's going on. He can go directly to the people, and again, that can be a good or a bad thing. They say this is what Reagan did, correct? That he would uh, use the bully pulpit, so-called, and go straight to the people and uh, twist Congress's arms by getting the people on the side. Now, is that a good or a bad thing? Well, that depends on whether you view the current uh, structure of the U.S. government as compatible with Scripture or not, or whether by Christian self-government we should be taking back parts of it uh, by governing ourselves according to the law of God, and this reduces the need for the external governance and shrinks the size of government properly in all the domains where right now it has very much expanded uh, to totalitarian proportions. Ford asks or says, Andrea noted that the Romans built the roads the early church used to spread the good news. That's a very good point, is that uh, something that might have been uh, for a, uh, a secular use from someone else, uh, the Christians are able to make use of it uh, and uh, extend their, the message of the gospel in this instance over roads that at one time were lined with crosses, say the Via Appia in Rome. Charles Roberts writes, You mentioned the Mac computer. I too am a Mac user, iPhone, etc. In terms of ethics, should we be concerned about the moral stance of a giant company like Apple and our purchase and use of their products? I believe is how the sentence would come. So this is an interesting point. This has to do with the question of transmission of guilt. Transmission of guilt that there is something in the metaphysics of a product that means its purchase uh, implicates the uh, purchaser in the sin of the people who made it. Now, how will you ever possibly know that maybe some part, like the battery or the painting on the battery, was done by somebody who was a non-believer who worshipped Satan and spent his life doing horrible things? You, you cannot know this. And the reason that this is important is that... <clears throat> Because we've grown away from individual justice to a notion of collective, collective or group justice, when we apply this to the domain of uh, commerce, all of a sudden, all of a sudden, we have this this same debate saying, "Well, if they're going to use their um, profits to do X, then I shouldn't buy their product because now I am funding X." No, you are not. Uh, let's take it several steps. First off, uh, I'll use an example and I'll go back to the Old Testament to show the correct understanding. That old lady that we spoke about, the last three lessons, the old widow, who threw in the two mites into the temple, she funded the crucifixion of Christ. She's an evil woman. 
because that money went into the same pot of money that was used to pay uh, Judas. See, she's a murderer. And I've just solved the whole problem. What you should do is not fund anything ever or buy anything. At that point, you can't be liable for anything. You see, the problem is that it wasn't that she put it in. It was the use that it was put to afterward. And this means that the scripture does not have a doctrine of collective guilt at all. It has a doctrine of individual guilt. It's stated this way in Ezekiel 18, the soul that sinneth, it shall die, not those that are related to it. In fact, the parable circulating, well, the fathers have eaten sour grapes, and the children have their teeth set on edge. This really upsets God, and he says, no more shall this proverb be spoken in Israel. He says, absolutely not. This is a lie against me, and it means you don't accept the notion of individual um, uh, um, responsibility. And this goes way back, if you think about it, to Nehemiah 13. What happens in Nehemiah 13? Very interesting stuff going on. There are folks outside the walls of Jerusalem who want to sell on the Sabbath day. And this doesn't go over well with Nehemiah, knowing it's a violation of God's law. Now, these are folks that are pure pagan, they're heathen. And they're not going to do anything good with the money except worship Molech and Kamosh and who knows what, not what Lash, all these uh, false gods. Um, perhaps even fund human sacrifice. Who knows? But the problem was not that they were buying and selling with the heathen who would use the money for a bad thing. It was that they were doing it on the Sabbath. So Nehemiah was very clear. If you come on the Sabbath, I will lay hands on you. Direct quote. <clears throat> I think he meant it. But we see his ethics is completely the reverse of modern Christian ethics. I will not buy from so-and-so, but I'll go shopping on the Sabbath day. You see, what's important to Nehemiah is meaningless to us, and what he regarded as non-consequential, we regard as the be-all and end-all of ethical understanding. I'm going to use my pocketbook as a weapon, so now I'm going to boycott. Now you've used the weapons of the world again. And at this point, once you use the worldly weapon, the weapons of the flesh, uh, that sword, you now you are subject to the sword. You know, those who take up the sword will die by the sword. So then come the boycotts against the Christians. And so we have both sides warring with weapons of the flesh. These are not spiritual weapons. And I've heard people say, well, we can make it a spiritual because when a Christian uses a, a weapon of the flesh, it's now a spiritual weapon. No, it's not. That's raw assertion. That's simply because you want God to endorse your use of a false mechanism. And it doesn't reflect the whole notion of Christian self-government in the first place. Now, <clears throat> as Rush said, he doesn't object that you voluntarily choose not to uh, buy from company A because of whatever reason you may have. There is liberty and freedom in that regard. But to then lay a moral requirement on everyone else to join you in your personal boycott, otherwise it doesn't have any effect, that's the problem. Because now you're going beyond scripture and you're binding the conscience of other folks to say we have to uh, operate according to this rule, otherwise you are supporting Satanism here, demonism there, ty tyranny there, etc., etc. The way you undercut all these tyrannies and Satanisms and demonisms is by establishing the law in your own life. You take your kids out of the public school, you the Christian school or homeschool them, and now, you, now, now you've broken from that system. You start to pay the poor tithe, and we start shrinking the massive welfare state when Christians are actually serious about the law of God instead of playing boycott games. To me, a boycott, being a weapon of the flesh, as defined by Paul in 2 Corinthians 10.4, is a pea shooter. It is not a bazooka. But the spiritual weapons of God that I just described, which look like pea shooters, are the true bazookas. Okay, Charles. Uh, let's see if we can roll this back down. It just scrolled off. When I served a mission work in the Phoenix area, I had members who refused to patronize Mormon-owned businesses, but they had no problems going to Starbucks, Walmart, and McDonald's. Well, this is modern morality and ethics in a, in a nutshell, isn't it, Charles? Is that... Um, we create these little partitions, these little zones, and uh, it's a game that's being played. And it's nothing more than a game just because you do it with a sanctimonious attitude. You know, I, you know, I thank the Lord that I'm not like that person who buys from that store, who has an Apple product in his pocket. You know, let's comment a little bit. I usually don't mention this example, but it's an interesting one. In the book of Esther, a gallows is being built. And the purpose of the gallows being built is to kill the righteous man, to, to execute him for violating the uh, commandment of the king. And what actually happens to that particular gallows? What is it used for? It kills the man who built it. So ultimately, all these things that are designed as a weapon against the kingdom of God will be used by God and re-diverted 
for his purposes. Because you don't know what's going to happen with the, you know, the wealth of the unjust is always laid up for the just. This is a principle laid out in Scripture constantly. They are uh, accumulating for themselves riches and, and benefits that they cannot keep, but that the kingdom of God will all inherit. So the notion that we have to stop it in the, at the nib now and boycott things and use unrightful, unrighteous weapons like a boycott uh, with all sorts of moral sounding language uh, misses the whole point. Even what they have has to be turned. Even the wrath of man shall praise thee, Psalm 76.10 tells us. So we don't have to despair of what the wicked are going to do any more than Nehemiah despaired of it. He was busy building that wall up, right? He wasn't going to let anything get in the way of it, least of all who his people were buying from. And if that meant that they were going to be purchasing from the heathen on the other side, he was fine with it so long as he didn't pollute the Sabbath. Are you interested in Christian education? Would you like to learn how to be a Christian teacher or how to run your very own Christian school with success? The GCS Apprenticeship Program can help. Learn more on our website at gcsapprenticeship.com. Let's see what the messages or questions were after that. So you can scroll up. Uh, Leah McHenry. That's why we still shop at Target, because we use our purchased goods in our daily life, which supports our endeavors to glorify God. Uh, and that's correct. And yet you'll have this oddball idea, uh, and because we've fallen to the notion of collective guilt, group justice, instead of individual justice, uh, you can be criticized for that. You're promoting some kind of other agenda. But if you are, then Nehemiah was promoting heathenism, and that w widow that Christ commended for giving all that she had uh, participated in the murder of Christ as a uh, supporter of it, endorser of it. It was an endorsement by her of everything that the Sanhedrin did with the money she gave them. No, the Sanhedrin was responsible for what it did with her money, they were called to be good stewards for righteous causes, and they didn't give a rip, and they went ahead and murdered their own king. And it's a whole different ballgame. So the soul that sinneth, it shall die. There is no transmission of guilt. Now, in Scripture, in Deuteronomy, there's a such thing as community responsibility. We see this example in uh, where there's a, a murder, an unsolved murder, that occurs between two different towns, and both the members of the towns come together, and they uh, offer a sacrifice together, acknowledging we did not see this happen, we didn't hear of it, but we want to take responsibility for it. That's a very, very different thing, the notion of community responsibility versus guilt, because guilt is used to manipulate people. And you can be manipulated into your new buying habits, things in this order, and uh, the problem you're solving is not going to be solved that way. Because the ultimate problem is an ethical, moral one at the individual justice level, and we don't never reach that when we're playing this, I'm going to punish this other company. Uh, again, that's a worldly weapon, and it should not be used, and it completely misconstrues how Christ rules and how God, in his providential governance over all things, routes even the bad things to support the kingdom. And that's a powerful notion that we should keep in mind. Let's see our next message. Oops. Got to be careful I don't delete comments. Uh, that criteria specifically does not apply to the tithe. Correct. Now, I guess that the criteria has to do with... Um, um, I'm not quite sure where Andre is going with that question. Let's see if she added anything more. Okay, stolen money or goods. Uh, that's a very good question. Should we be trafficking in stolen money or goods? No, because um, restitution is required of the Christian. In fact, if you look at um, Acts 3.21, right? The heavens must contain him until the time of the restitution of all things. So the whole universe is awaiting full restitution for everything to the extent that we can go forward with it. So, yeah, you should not be trafficking in, uh, or buying stolen goods and things of this order. That's a whole different ball game. Uh, okay, yeah, we, Arne, Andrea continued the question. We are responsible to where we tithe. Correct. The tithe is intended to support the kingdom of God. You cannot simply say, I'm going to give it to X church, and um, I wash my hands at that point. This is a little bit different area because uh, you have discernment as to the use of the tithe. And we have, for example, in opening to chapters 2 and 3 of Revelation, seven different churches with seven different spiritual health indicators. And some of them obviously are not going to use the tithe very well and some of them would be extremely faithful in the use of the tithe. 
There's the story that Rashtuni tells, uh, and it's mentioned prominently in Tithing and Dominion. I think every single Q&A session we've referenced that book, and Andre, if you want to put it back up, a link to it, it never hurts. Uh, about the man who uh, actually did not send his tithe to the priests and Levites. He, he gave it to the school of the prophets instead because the word of God uh, was, and the kingdom of God was being promoted outside the institutional boundaries at that point. So apostate had become the church at the time and so worthless, like sand that lost it, salt that lost its savor, uh, that he went where he knew the tithe money would not be wasted. Uh, at that point, yes, you are on the hook because the tithe money is where you direct it. Now, that can be a pretty controversial idea because there's certainly conflicting Reconstructionist thinking that says the church should get the entirety of the tithe, you shut up and pay it. And uh, that's the end of the matter. And we would uh, certainly take issue with that. Uh, has there been an open dialogue between the two schools? No, it's uh, been basically one-sided pot shots from the other side so far. So perhaps that might change in the future, but it would be nice to get on the same page or at least understand the nature of the arguments. Uh, I think the case that Dr. Rishtuni makes is a difficult one to, to countermand, and what you really need to do is discuss this back and forth so it gets to the counter-counter-rebuttal stage, not just when it's pot shots. Let's see, two, two scrolled up. Okay, thank you. Roberto Corral writes, Dr. Rishtuni taught me that without the tithe, voluntariness requirements, men and man cannot have godly dominion. Right, because uh, the social aspects of the tithe uh, are what God has provided as the mechanism through his law for dominion. And this capitalizes various things that are important, starting with the education of your children. The, only the tithe of the tithe, according to Numbers 18, 25 to 26, and in Nehemiah 10, 38, goes to institutional worship. 90% of the tithe is to go for uh, education. Uh, and, uh, and it's in the minor aspect of health and things of this order. And that's where it's supposed to be going. So I've said it before on these messages. If you have a church where they're getting the entire tithe and all those kids are in public school, God's going to have words with that church and with that pastor for setting that kind of system in motion and leaving the kingdom of God in the lurch to be taught by the practitioners of Molech, the, the uh, master state concept. So, and if you don't, if you aren't willing to tithe, Biblically, if you're not going to be willing, for example, to do the poor tithe, which is only 3.3% of your increase every year, or 10% every third year, which is the way the Bible puts it together, uh, you're guilty of grinding the faces of the poor, as uh, Isaiah puts it. And uh, we've spoken about this every single Q&A, too. Apparently, it's a popular topic. I'll say again, Israel did not keep the poor tithe until the Maccabean era when they came back uh, from the dispersion into Babylon. And at that point, they eradicated poverty in all of Israel. It's a remarkable fact recorded in Second uh, Maccabees. And they had a surplus in the temple because any time that you could not give someone the, the poor tithe because you had no poor people to give it to, the surplus went for a rainy day to the temple. And they had, I think it was uh, 200 talents of gold and 600 talents of silver stored up as excess surplus that couldn't be paid to anybody because they couldn't find any poor people to pay it to to lift out of poverty. A lot of other aspects to it, but that just shows that you can get there. However, within 180 odd years, uh, they did decline. They stopped keeping the poor tithe. And then we have the Mark 10 example, which we've said every single Q&A. So I'm singing it for the fourth time, uh, and it's worth repeating. Mark 10, that rich young ruler, he was guilty of not paying the poor tithe. He was guilty of do not defraud. One of the commandments that Jesus lists off on top of his head: Thou shalt not defraud. The Greek word apostoresis is used for defrauding of the poor tithe, for grinding the face of the poor. And as we said, Zacchaeus, he said, whoever I defrauded, I'll restore fourfold, which was the biblical requirement. The Christian ruler was told he had lacked one thing of the four things he asserted. I keep all these. No, he lacked one thing, Jesus says. You have to give, sell you all you have and give it to the poor. And that would constitute the fourfold restitution. He wouldn't do it. See, For... Uh, so I think it's very, very powerful stuff. The, uh, the poor tithe can remove poverty entirely in a nation if it keeps it. And it's a lot less expensive than the war on poverty that Lyndon B. Johnson set in motion. Status mechanisms, because they don't follow God's law, and because uh, they involve enormous bureaucracy in the middle, the middleman taking its pot, uh, cut, and therefore having no interest in solving the problem, but rather perpetuating it, uh, you never solve the problem.
So the way to solve the problem is for the Christians to be serious about the poor tithe, and that, by definition, will shrink the welfare state. So long as we don't pay any attention to the poor tithe, we are doomed to uh, be suckered into this current system and to continue paying for it, uh, and, and that's a disaster. Let's see if there's any questions past the Roberto's. Doesn't choosing to give money to Christian businesses also increase his dominion? Uh, if the it, it can certainly, but the the vision. I mean, if you're going to say over and above the tithe, I don't have a problem with that. I think all Christian businesses should be uh, capitalized because those folks are self-consciously uh, promoting the kingdom of God and all that they're doing and all that they're saying, uh, and that makes it certainly a big difference. Uh, this is particularly true in education. I think we don't do um, really well at the college level. Uh, I think the weakness that we have is that we say we just want to have a liberal arts curriculum, in the old sense of the word, the arts that lend themselves to inculcating liberty, which is all well and good, but it leaves a whole bunch of the creation untouched. The physical hard sciences, for example, and medicine and things in this order are not in that package, that liberal arts package, and it leaves those things to the humanist to govern and rule and set the rules for, and the standards for. Because if we're not producing the hard scientists and the humanists are, guess what? Down the line, that's a field that will be dominated by the humanists because the Christians, again, evacuated the area. We're doing liberal arts. We're doing uh, political science. We're doing social science. This is the extent of our reconstruction. So I'm very big on saying dominion is across the board. You have to fire all the arrows. To use this uh, example when Elisha and uh, jo Joab had the, uh, Joash had the, that great little interlude with the arrow shooting episode. Uh, you have to shoot all the arrows. Everything has to be uh, brought to the dominion of Christ. And the example I always give at uh, conferences, because it's a, become a, a funny little shibboleth of our own, is that if every topic in the world, every discipline, has been brought to the dominion of Christ except respiratory pharmacology, then every humanist will become a respiratory pharmacologist. They have to go to that spot because that's the only place that they are not confronted with the Word of God and His presence over that discipline. So our job is to have, leave no escape for anybody, no excuse, and we do that by pursuing all the disciplines, including the ones involved in business. An interesting little group called Business uh, Ministry as Business or Business as Ministry. That's the one, where they take uh, capitalistic mechanisms, Christian capitalism, if you will, and show how that you can uh, renew nations and and put them back on a better footing, which improves the uh, the gospel's uh, reach too at the same time. So, okay, Ford asks, must one attend a local church even if there are none faithful to the law, word of God in your area? This get, gets us into the question of should, must, could, ought. Thing, and uh, that's an awfully good question. And uh, it's going to wait for another time because what we're doing is developing a, um, an, a full bore answer to this question based on the doctrine of the church. And we had a similar question last week, and I pointed out that it is uh, a symptom of an underlying problem. And it would be a mistake to then speak to the symptom without addressing the underlying problem first which involves the relationship of the local church to the invisible church, visible to invisible church. Uh, we don't have that quite right yet. And this also dovetails with things that Dr. Rashtuni wrote in the book Sovereignty, where he points out that what occurred was that sovereignty which should be only belonging to God and not to man. God, man is not the Lord. God is Lord and ultimate. That the church brought sovereignty into its own domain and claimed it for itself. And as a result, it taught the state to do the same thing. And the state uh, didn't acknowledge the church's claim to sovereignty. But the whole point of sovereignty being introduced into the state era, era uh, occurred because the church was the vestibule, the intermediary by which this dangerous idea about the sovereignty of man uh, was introduced. It's through the church. So the church continues to play a game with sovereignty. They'll say, oh, no, he's the only blessed and only potentate. But when you get right down to it, there are a lot of potentates, a lot of popes. Uh, and that is problematic because it means that in the doctrine of sovereignty, we have um, inherited ideas that are not scriptural. Uh, maybe them, some of them are well-intended. That's not the point. The point is, are they biblical or not? Not if they have a good purpose or intent. 
right? So, and one reason that Dr. Rashtuni has not been 1 million percent negative on the Constitution is because when the Constitution of the U.S. was written, they omitted the term sovereignty from it. They did not acknowledge sovereignty as a human uh, concern, that sovereignty belonged only to God. I think he makes the comment that uh, Secretary of State Lansing in the early 19th, uh, 20th century even drew attention to this fact in a document uh, that he wrote that uh, we don't acknowledge sovereignty of any entity, uh, you know, human entity. It doesn't belong. It's not an attribute of anyone but God. So that autopilot didn't last very long. We kind of uh, lost the fuel on that. And now sovereignty is claimed routinely by uh, even the most petty bureaucrats at the most small, smallest levels of city government. And you're looking at the petty gods. And uh, it's the church brought them to the play. And the church not only brought it, it persists in a lot of the aspects of it. So we have to clean house on who's truly God first, who's truly sovereign. Uh, all the vestiges of uh, human claims to arrogate sovereignty to the church or any offices in the church uh, also need to be dealt with. And that's an important reform that is uh, ongoing. And there are churches that are very much in tune with this idea. And there are those who believe it's, uh, it's a threat to their existence. And so wisdom shall be justified of all her children on this point. If something is not built on the word of God, it is doomed. Uh, this is the whole point of the shaking in Hebrews 12, right? Verses 22 to 28, 29. Uh, all things are being shaken and laid in ruins so that the kingdom of God remains. Uh, only the unshakable thing will remain. And anything founded on the notion that anyone other than God is sovereign or any institution is sovereign outside of God is doomed. It's built on sand. It's built on a claim that is consistent with Genesis 3, 5's temptation. Usually because God is determining right and wrong, good and evil, as opposed to God being the sole determiner of these things. So uh, that's where I'm going to leave that question until we have the chance to build our foundation and uh, then we can answer that question more coherently uh, from a sound uh, basis and, and not get off in the weeds, which is going to happen very quickly if we aren't cognizant that we're doing, doing with something that's way up here. There's a foundational principle, then there's issues, and the, the word issue means to issue forth from that, and like water issuing forth from a, 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 a um, artesian well. And so it's way up here at the issues, which that question embodies, and then we had the foundational principles down here at the bottom where it bubbled up from. So. Symptomatic relief is not going to cut as much. It's going to be temporary. It'll make some people feel good, some people feel bad, and the foundational problem will still persist. So we have to attack the foundational problem first and apply the Word of God unapologetically, unceasingly uh, to that problem. Okay. Yeah, interesting about thing about the OED, the uh, ultimate arbiter, as they call it. Uh, certainly, dictionaries... Maybe um, one of my technical directors can put up an article that I wrote called um, Worldview Contamination. It has to do with the uh, Christian Reconstruction of Linguistics, published a few years back. But it talks about the differences in dictionary content uh, and what motivates different dictionaries to have up to 10% differences in there. And it is that the worldviews and the approaches to language control and govern what's in the dictionary. It is not objective. It is not some neutral... Uh, describer of reality. Rather, it already embodies a worldview and a perspective and a bias. And if you don't know this and you use a dictionary thinking, oh, this is the truth, I can trust this, you're going to make a big mistake. Uh, the first dictionaries, of course, would have been 1828 uh, by Noah Webster, a known Christian who taught himself the biblical languages, which is a remarkable uh, feat in itself. Uh, thank you for that, Kelsey. And uh, I have an 1828 reprint and it's valuable to see how the examples that he gave were almost all biblical. And if they weren't straight out of the scripture, they were quotations from folks with a biblical worldview. So the worldview in which that dictionary was embedded was an explicitly Christian one, even at that time, 1828. And we don't use that dictionary anymore, but it's interesting to me that a lot of the homeschoolers in the, from the 1880s on started to use that dictionary and bring it back into play because they realized that Liberty as a concept was not going to be uh, built on a foundation that was fundamentally opposed to liberty. 
which all humanism is. All humanism fundamentally enslaves man to the law of man, as opposed to the law of God which liberates us. All right. Do we have any other questions? I'm not sure what our time frame is. But yeah, I see that um, that reference there is uh, was placed up there. Uh, and while we're talking about language, note what Luther achieved by translating the Bible into German. He standardized the entire German language, almost single-handedly. Single it's an astonishing thing. One can argue similarly for what Tyndale achieved with the, uh, his Bible translations, which became the core of the authorized version later on. That's why I think you should, um, for folks inclined to get a little technical, should read that article that was just posted there on worldview contamination, because you realize that language is an important tool, and linguistics has not been dealt with properly from a Christian perspective. And I wanted to um, shake things up a bit. I wrote that back in about 1994-95, and uh, did a very extensive six-hour lecture series uh, at um, one of the I think it was in Lynchburg, Virginia, at a Christian uh, college. And it was uh, quite the marathon session with my PowerPoint slides going through to show, one, how completely humanistic the linguistic process has become. Most people don't realize it. I had to open your, everyone's eyes to the fact that it is inundated and swamped in humanism and atheism and anti-Christian, anti-biblical ideas. Marxism, in fact, infects it terribly. Most people aren't aware that that language that studies uh, and we don't. Even, I don't even go far into Orwell. Orwell's a whole different uh, application of the same truths. But as setting Orwell aside, we can just see how fouled up linguistics is. And if that is the tool for communication, and that's already heavily weighted toward a humanistic result by how it's structured, uh, we can see that subversion has occurred in the very tools that we need to use. So we need to recover these tools. And so if Christians aren't serious about linguistics, about language, then we're going to be trying to present ideas in a language that doesn't lend itself well to it. So you can recover all this. It's an area of reconstruction that's just waiting for someone to come and dig in and move forward and take that back to, back to Christ. Again, Chalcedon emphasizes trying to start and, and, and focus other folks into beginning. You know, Dr. Rashtuni wasn't the be-all and end-all, we always say. He wasn't the final word. He wanted to set people in motion. He says, here's a starting point, a launch pad. Start here and jump. Anywhere, but jump. Just don't those, just bump, jump. Keep the Bible in your uh, rearview mirror and make sure that's your guide. And a lot of big things can be achieved merely by folks being faithful in little things. Because if you're faithful in little things, the promise is made that you'll be given big things to govern too. Right now we're not really passing that faithful in little things test. I believe that that uh, whole mechan we might actually try to put that back together again. Jill Judd asks about that teaching on liter on linguistics. The whole thing was recorded, audio, and there is a PowerPoint presentation. So in theory, uh, someone had six hours to put it all together. We could reassemble the entire talk. <coughs> so uh, gluttons for punishment, uh, contact me, and we could certainly take a look at doing that. And. Um, I'll just ask uh, my technical director, how are we doing on time? <laughs> See, I thought you liked CJ. <laughs> so, um, I know that uh, Paul Michael Raymond was there when I delivered that lecture, and Kevin Clausen was the um, head of that uh, college. And it was quite a good group. and uh, But in a warm building, six hours of discussion, uh, it doesn't matter if I'm the greatest orator in the world, and I'm not. I'm more about the substance than the presentation. Uh, it's going to be a, a long haul. But most people who understood the meaning of imp importance of it uh, received it. Oh, we are done at this point. All right. I, uh, it was a different kind of discussion than usual. Again, like I said at the outset, we'll uh, inform you of if we're going to go forward with next week's Q&A, because I will be in Pennsylvania at that time. I don't fly out of there till about 9-ish at night or so. Uh, so in principle, I would be available. I just don't know where I will physically be and what my uh, technical setup will be, would it allow us to do the QA. But if we can at all do it, 
and I know the folks at Mars, Mid-Atlantic Reformation Society, uh, would love to have me uh, do it from their facilities. Uh, we'll go forward. Thank you all for participating and uh, for all the support and encouragement. And blessings to you all. Uh, hopefully we'll see you next week, and if not two weeks from now, wish us well at the conference and uh, pray for the movie, which receives its rough cut. Uh, we're talking about a major reconstruction of the uh, addiction medicine and its importance to the world at large. It's something where Christian reconstruction has something to offer that I think is huge, and the need is uh, very, very vivid. So to that end, I will leave it and uh, I'll hear from you perhaps when I'm in Pennsylvania. Goodbye, all. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Meat of the Word Q&A with Martin Salbretti. We pray that you have been edified by the content that you've heard on this episode. Please visit calcedon.edu for some great resources and reconstructionistradio.com to download your favorite audiobooks. Until next time, may the Lord richly bless you in all that you do. The Reconstructionist Radio Podcast Network brings to you a complete lineup of podcasts where you will hear practical and tactical theology. Our desire is not simply that you consume our shows, but that you also live out your faith in every area of life. We can talk all day long about these things, but if we fail to put them into practice, then we fail as ambassadors of Jesus Christ our King. Subscribe now to your favorite Reconstructionist Radio Podcast Network shows. Or you can subscribe to the Reconstructionist Radio Master Feed, where all of the content we produce, including the audiobooks and audio articles, will pop up as soon as they are available. And don't forget to visit ReconstructionistRadio.com to volunteer as a narrator or to partner with this ministry financially. May the Holy Spirit stir you into action for Christ and His Kingdom.